Hi, welcome to the next lecture in the Existentialism course, Philosophy 3511. Um, this one entitled, The First Existentialist. Um, existentialism has a, uh, a reputation for being about European people from the 20th century, especially uh, French, some German, uh, and especially uh, post-war Europe. Um, in these couple of lectures to start us off, I'm going to try to suggest why we should think of uh, existentialism as being much older, as being, in fact, an original part of philosophy, and that we think of the first existentialist in Western philosophy as Socrates. Um, the reason I have first in quotation marks uh, is because uh, he didn't set out to be an existentialist. Uh, in the sense that we understand it today, but he was doing the same kind of thing that the existentialists were. And um, also because he's simply the first that we know about. And we know about Socrates, uh, as famous as he is, almost exclusively from the works of Plato. Not entirely, but mostly. And had that not been the case, had, not, had he not gained that kind of popularity, we might not know much about him at all. Uh, and that's probably true of lots of other people throughout history. Uh, there are probably a number of people who might have preceded Socrates, even who could be considered, so to speak, the first existentialist. But uh, from what we know, and in Western history, it's, it's relatively safe to think of Socrates this way, as the first person to be concerned with the kinds of things that become uh, a major uh, leitmotif of the 20th century, uh, at least in Europe. So um, in this lecture what we're going to try to do is get a sense uh, of how um, existentialism fits in with and as I said earlier against uh, the philosophical tradition of the West. And to start us off here's um, a likeness, a bust of Socrates uh, who lived as you see there around 400, 450 BC, and um, had a reputation, uh, at least among his fellow Greeks, as not being a particularly attractive man. Uh, in this likeness, the face seems to have a great deal of character, uh, though not the kind of beauty that the Greeks would have um, celebrated. And um, Socrates has a reputation for being concerned with something like inner beauty, or what we might now, in retrospect, call character. Uh, and that's really uh, the way that we can think about existentialists, as uh, people who are trying to figure out what kind of person they ought to be. Uh, it's possible to say the kind of person one ought to be, but... Um, the concern for both the existentialists and Socrates for um, how people in general ought to behave or what they ought to do is really secondary uh, and only serves a purpose in terms of what they themselves ought to do, the kind of person they would like to become uh, or think best, uh, think it's best to become. So Socrates is a precursor to all of these things and in one sense was doing them uh, in a vacuum in a number of ways. He seems to be the only person in his culture to be doing this kind of thing. And we know that because there isn't an audience, even yet really for philosophy per se, uh, but definitely not for existentialism, that Socrates was not doing this to get the attention of other people. He was focused on what kind of person he himself wanted to be. We do have some biographical information on Socrates. There's not much. Uh, besides his appearance, we know that his father was a stonemason. Uh, that is, he cut stone for a living. And in that part of the world at the time, uh, there would be no shortage of work because there was an enormous amount of stone that went into building, uh, even as the, the ruins uh, show us, all of the things that were part of Greek culture at the time. Uh, his mother was a midwife. And uh, while Socrates himself cut stone for money whenever he needed it, and only when he needed it, he, was, he lived uh, a rather poor life financially, 
Um, while he did that for money, he considered himself a midwife. Uh, and here I have to the truth. Socrates never claimed that there was such a beast as truth. Uh, but something like that uh, seemed to be implied in his quest for figuring out what he ought and ought not do. Um, instead of truth, one, one might replace something like honesty. Uh, in retrospect, we might uh, apply the word truth to Socrates, thinking he meant something like uh, uh, what we today would call the correspondence theory of knowledge or representationalism, whether your ideas are getting the world right. Socrates is thinking more in terms of his conscience, what he feels is right. Um, so much less the kind of uh, epistemological notion that we have today. Uh, he had a wife and three sons, had the three sons late in life. Um, and as I said before, Plato is the, the source of most of our information, not the biographical, but uh, the dialogues in which we get a sense of uh, Socrates' character. And from one of Plato's works called The Symposium, uh, we get a, a passage uh, spoken uh, presumably by a character named Alcibiades, uh, uh, just the opposite of Socrates in the eyes of the Greek, a very attractive, uh, handsome man, who says of Socrates' method of interacting with people, uh, he says, the first time a person lets himself listen to one of Socrates' arguments, it sounds really ridiculous. Uh, and the reason is, uh, Socrates very often would go off on tangents to, um, in effect, clarify a point. Um, Socrates' method, which he's modeling on uh, what his mom did as a midwife, is to try to glean information out from the interaction of two speakers. And so... When two people are talking to one another, very often they need to clarify a point on which they're, uh, they're, they're discussing about. And um, today we might just, uh, you know, Google it or um, look up a precedent in a legal case or something like that. But um, in Socrates' day, nothing like that existed, so you would have to go off and start talking about what seemed to be other things in order to clarify a point and then come back and continue with what you were doing. So the ridiculousness that Alcibiades is talking about has to do largely with that. He says then, but if you could see them opened up, that is the arguments, if you can get through to what's under the surface, they turn out to be extremely far-reaching. They cover everything which needs to be taken into consideration on the true path to goodness. Um, which can seem like an odd thing to say because not only is he in the end convinced that Socrates' arguments are good ones, that he's good at argumentation, but that argument can somehow lead to goodness. Um, the people around at the time, uh, collectively called the Sophists, traveling teachers, promised to teach young men of Athens how to become good. That is, good citizens of Athens, good at argumentation, uh, train them to become leaders of the community, members of the assembly, the senate, and so on. Um, but Socrates... Uh, because he wasn't like the Sophist in that he didn't claim to have any knowledge, didn't charge a fee for anything, argued, so to speak, for the sake of it. But as Alcibiades is pointing out here, the result was that one becomes a better person. And um, that seems to have been Socrates' goal throughout. He's concerned with what you and I might call the facts of the matter, figuring out what's what. But his motivation for doing it seems to have been himself, that in order to know what I ought to do, I need to know what's what. I need to understand things. And so he's going around talking to people and trying to get a sense of what they know and uh, figure out what's uh, believable, what's credible, etc., and what's not. Now, these other people, these sophists, uh, were itinerant or traveling teachers. Um, and Socrates, as it says here, didn't uh, write or teach. Um, having not written, we have to rely largely on Plato. Uh, but one of the things to keep in mind is um, Plato's dialogues were written after Socrates' death uh, over a period of about 20 years. So you would have to think of someone 
who thinks they know you well, chronicling what they think you thought after your death. So, as you can imagine, there isn't anyone who would really get it right. Uh, even if you were to write down what you thought, you might be dissatisfied with uh, what you'd actually written, that you hadn't completely said all that you hoped to say. So what chance does someone else who never has really been you have, uh, have of saying what you really thought? So we always have to keep that in mind. Um, but when compared with the sophists, the word sophist comes from sophos or sophia, uh, meaning that these were the wise men. These were the, the most educated people of the time and educated by other individuals like themselves because before Plato there was no institution of higher learning. So these teachers would have traveled around to wealthy families teaching the sons of Greek uh, aristocracy, uh, soon to become the founding members of Greek democracy, um, how to argue and what information there was to argue about, i.e. all the stuff that you and I might now find in dictionaries and encyclopedias and whatnot. So uh, Socrates seemed to have had a quite different goal because if we believe Plato, he was the best of the uh, rhetoricians, that is, best at argumentation among all these people, and yet he didn't teach, so he couldn't charge a fee. So he remained poor and had to continue with cutting stone like his father had to make a few dollars. Uh, and that's because he seems to have had a different goal. He wasn't out to win arguments, which he always did, if we believe Plato, uh, but seeking the truth. And I have it here in quotation marks for the reason I just mentioned, that uh, it's something much more like what really se genuinely seems to be the case, rather than what you can talk people into. Uh, the sophists are accused of being uh, relativists because they are contending in effect that if you can talk enough people into something, then it makes it so, or that truth is relative to agreement among some culture. And so um, if we here in Greece believe something, then it's true for us, whereas if people in another place agree, about some, uh, agree in some other direction about the same kind of thing, then that's true for them. And truth, objectively understood, doesn't seem like the kind of thing that is amenable to that kind of relativistic approach. So, while well, Socrates seemed to be some kind of bridge between the two, uh, one can interpret him as being uh, an objectivist like Plato, though that's pro most likely a misreading. And um, one could also make him seem like uh, he's a sophist, which people like uh, the writer Aristophanes in his day did, they lampooning Socrates along with the sophist because he saw them talking, saw him talking to them. Uh, it's kind of a guilt by association thing. So you can think of Socrates as not really sure of anything and curious to find out as much as he can if anyone actually does have knowledge. So <clears throat> the reason he has this um, mission, you might say, is he wants to figure out how best to live. Um, most Greeks, uh, unlike many people today, uh, had no belief in an afterlife in the way that we know it. Uh, they had a, a concept of Hades. They, they thought of there being another world, but they didn't have the sort of sense of uh, personal immortality uh, that comes later in the Judeo-Christian sense. Um, uh, Socrates admits as much in a couple of uh, dialogues that he isn't sure whether his dying is going to mean um, an eternal sleep or whether he's going to shuffle off to some other uh, world or something like that. So they have the idea, but the Greek goal is to, to live as well as possible during this finite amount of time, which may be all eternity for humans. So Socrates wants to be the best person he can, hence this concern with character. So he felt that if someone tried to sell virtue, which the sophists claimed to be able to do, then they necessarily misunderstood it. Uh, it would be like me saying that I understand the nature of friendship and I'm willing to sell it to you. Uh, that is the information and for an extra fee I will be your friend. Um, that kind of talk suggests that I necessarily misunderstand the very nature of friendship. So Socrates is looking upon the sophists as charlatans, the 
kind of uh, thinking that uh, we might have today of someone who's called a sophist, uh, commits sophism or sophistry, um, the pretense of wisdom. But again, he's linked uh, by many people with the sophist because at the time we don't have these kind of historical perspectives uh, with which to look at Socrates from. So what we have to do is try to figure out what it is about this project of Socrates that differed from other people. And the first point is to think that his primary, primary concern is with himself. Uh, as I said before, Socrates is not someone who is uh, financially either successful or concerned to be. He's not greedy in that sense, not what you and I might call selfish. But he is self-centered in the sense that his concern is with his self or his soul, his mind, uh, whatever it is that one would put the label Socrates on. Um, so his concern is not with um, his financial well-being, but with his, what some people might call spiritual, or what would be better to sum both of them up for the Greeks, his psychological well-being, that is, uh, a concern with his psyche. Now, the fancy name for Socrates' method, the Socratic method, is dialectic. But etymologically, that's just two people talking, right? It's <laughs> one person talking to another in something like a Q&A session uh, where one person asks the other a question and the other responds. But it's a critical type of Q&A because ideally A is asking questions of B in order to find the weaknesses in B's position, and B is doing the same with respect to A. Now, the sophists would have been some, doing something very much like this as well. Their goal, though, would be for one side to defeat the other. Right? If you're A, your goal is to defeat B, or if you're B, to defeat A. Or, if you're arguing in front of an assembly, your goal is to, to convince as many people as possible that your position is superior to that of, the, of your opponent. And since we are dealing with the beginnings of democracy in Athens, if you can get a majority of people to agree with you, and this is where the sophist relativism comes in, then you would be judged to be right. Not that you simply won the argument, but that what you are contending is what some might call the truth. Uh, it might be best to characterize that as the preferred opinion, but the sophist point is, and this goes for lots of people with a skeptical attitude toward epistemology, whichever opinion is approved of is the one we always call the truth until we find a better opinion. So um, the sophist point is that when A beats B or B beats A in their eyes or in our own, we judge them to be right, not just that they've won, but that they are right. And that's where Socrates' dialectical method differs from that of the sophists. To Socrates' mind, the goal is not simply to beat the opposition. As I said before, if we uh, listen to Plato, he could do that readily. It was very easy for Socrates to out-argue his opponents. Um, but he thought that in the same manner that his mother performed births, Socrates would help give birth to uh, a more refined position, you might say, between A and B. So while A is criticizing B and B is criticizing A, they're not doing it to be mean to each other or to um, defeat the opposition. They're doing it in a common project to find where they're going wrong, so that A and B help each other to see their own blind spots. I use the opponent to help find the things that I'm unable to see, the weak spots in my own argument. So it's what some people today might call constructive criticism. Socrates is liken, likening what he does to what his mom does because he sees it as uh, delivering uh, the offspring from two parents. If you think of a couple who are having a baby, uh, they may be critical of one another, 
but only for the sake of the child. Um, they are not going to be very good parents and not going to be much help in either having or raising the child if their only goal is to defeat the other person. So um, what Socrates is thinking of is my mom helps people deliver babies. They're, the babies are not hers, just as this uh, refined position is not mine, this improved position that comes out of their uh, interaction. Uh, but I'm going to help uh, bring it forth, so to speak. Um, now, if one is a midwife, one isn't just trying to um, help deliver the baby at the time the time that it's born. A midwife also had to ensure the heritage. So while she can be sure that it's mom's baby because she's there for the birth, she can't be sure that it's the father's unless she's there or nearby at conception and can make sure all the while that there are no other suitors. So in the same way, Socrates is thinking, I need to make sure that C can be derived from A and B. So he's using uh, the metaphor of a midwife to do something like show the, the basic structure of argumentation. Can I get to this conclusion from these premises? Does A and B lead to C? So what he's getting at is that the nuts and bolts of the argument don't seem to have as much to do with who says them. Uh, the way that the sophists were contending, uh, that it's not style of argumentation and all that, as how the argument is constructed. So he's, he's really starting to focus on what people in philosophy think of as argument, <clears throat> in the philosophical sense, not fighting, but justification of claims. So what Socrates is thinking is this, instead of just A talking to B and B to A, in order to produce C, what we need are two things. A and B have to honestly say what they think. Right? This would be almost something like tracking the genes of parents. We have to have a clear picture of what A and B are in order to know that they have produced C. A and B have to honestly say what they think. It doesn't matter what they think, but they have to be honest about it. And they have to be willing to change their position if the evidence or justification given by the other merits it. So the example I usually use is if I'm arguing with Socrates and I say the earth is flat and he says it's round and he puts me on a boat and sails me in the same in one direction and I wind up back in the same spot, I have to change my opinion about the shape of the earth. My flat earth hypothesis won't stand up to the evidence that Socrates has presented. So uh, if I just do those things, honestly say what I think, and am willing to follow the argument where I should, based on evidence and justification, then we can make this kind of progress. Otherwise, Socrates is thinking, forget it. If I run into someone who won't change their mind, no matter how much evidence I give them, then that person is simply being dogmatic. That is, they are advocating some kind of dogma or creed and are unwilling to change their mind no matter what happens. And Socrates thinks that's useless. So he's only going to argue with people who are willing to engage in this procedure. And it's, it's very rare to find someone like that. And Socrates realizes it. And it it's actually becomes a, a big problem for him. Um, but that's why we're interested in him. Because Socrates isn't just trying to get along with people. Uh, he isn't trying to hurt them. But he's, he's trying to do what he thinks is right and to figure out what's right. Uh, regardless, so to speak, of whether that jives with his uh, fellow Athenians. This last point is illustrated in one of Plato's dialogues called the Gorgias. Um, and Plato's dialogues are always, not always, but mostly named after the people that Socrates is talking to. Uh, so in this dialogue, it's evident how odd Socrates is as a person. Instead of just trying to get along with his fellow Athenians, uh, not rock the boat, uh, accept common opinion, that kind of thing, 
Socrates is trying to figure out for himself what he ought to believe. And we, we find it commendable. Even people who are not in, interested in existentialism find it commendable that someone would care enough about uh, some matter, uh, especially enough about themselves, to take this high-minded approach to say, uh, I'm going to find out for myself what I believe is right. Uh, my parents may have told me something, my political leaders might advocate a certain something, but I'm concerned to see if any of those are right, uh, and if so, why, and why the others uh, I consider mistaken, etc. So, <clears throat> in this dialogue, Socrates says, if you're the same kind of person I am, I'd be glad to continue questioning you. Otherwise, let's forget it. So remember, if, if the person's not interested in, in trying to improve upon the knowledge that we have on some subject, or to criticize my position in order that we might both benefit from this process, then there's no point in it. If they aren't going to be honest about what they think, uh, or they're not going to be willing to change their position uh, if the argument requires, then there's no point. So Socrates then says, well, what kind of, uh, what kind of person am I? I'm happy to have a, a mistaken idea of mine proved wrong, which is a, a strange thing. Most people don't want their ideas proven wrong. Um, uh, it makes them feel bad. But Socrates felt that it was... Um, beneficial, that you're doing him a favor. He says, and I'm happy to prove someone else's mistaken ideas wrong. That's, of course, much more common. But Socrates thinks he's actually doing you a favor. He's pointing out something that you hadn't noticed. Um, it's like some, saying you've got something in your teeth. Right? It's, it's not to belittle you, it's so that you can get it out and smile confidently without the spinach hanging there. Um, but he says just after that, there's nothing worse for a person than holding mistaken views. Rather than finding something in your teeth, he thinks he's, he's helping you remove a, an idea that's mistaken or questionable from your mind so that uh, he's helping you uh, get rid of something that's hindering your progress. Uh, and he thinks that if you do that to him, you're benefiting him as much as possible. And this is, this is one of the reasons why we can think of Socrates as an existentialist. He's not thinking of knowledge as theoretical in the sense that it's something that can be put on a server, it can be put up in a cloud, that it can be used by anyone anywhere. It has nothing personal about it. Socrates is thinking of knowledge, what we would call knowledge, as uh, what makes up that person. And so Socrates takes this extremely personally. He thinks that as we'll see in just a second, he is what he knows, that the, the favor that you're doing him by criticizing him is literally making him a better person. Or, as I said to con, um, continue that self-centeredness, you're actually not just making him a better person, you're, you're making more of a person of him uh, for reasons that I'll come to in just a little while. He actually thinks he's growing in, in size or stature. And so... Um, He's definitely a rarity. There are very few people who take knowledge this personally. Uh, and so you can think of him as someone who's almost a glutton for it. He's just like eager to get as much of this stuff as he can, though most of the time when he finds it, it's not the genuine artifact that he had hoped it would be. But at least he knows what's the weed and what's the chaff. If I find out that something I thought was valuable turns out not to be, that in itself is, is a, a, a help. And so Socrates is saying, let me find the people who can do that kind of thing. We can see this relation spelled out even clearer in another of Plato's dialogues, uh, Mino, um, where Socrates says, there's one proposition that I defend to the death if I could, by argument and by action, which as we'll see will matter, that as long as we think we should search for what we don't know will be better people, less faint-hearted and lazy, than if we were to think that we had no chance of discovering what we don't know, and that there's no point in even searching for it. Um, the sophists were implying that um, 
the best opinion is the one that is most convincing to the majority of people. Uh, that means that anything what we would call the truth uh, is simply the opinion that has won. Uh, and so once we have that opinion uh, and think that the only truth we might get beyond that is simply an opinion that beats it, that we'll never sort of break through from the level of opinion to something else entirely called the truth, then it seems to Socrates that causes us to rest on our laurels, to sort of sit back and say, well, that's, that's all we ever, will ever do is sort of get a best opinion, and it's always going to be someone's opinion, so why knock yourself out? And he thinks it actually makes us uh, what he's here calling faint-hearted and lazy. We don't try. Now, if there is no such beast as the truth, then there's really no reason to try. If the sophists are right, then we can keep getting improved opinions or opinions that are more convincing to more people, that kind of thing. But we're never going to get anything that's anything other than an opinion. Um, so why would we go through all this trouble? And this is where Socrates is, is thinking of this aspiration less as uh, what I called earlier an epistemological one, that is a concern for knowledge in an objective sense that Plato will try to get, um, but more uh, of a personal one, where we think of it as becoming a better person, not more learned, but better. And that's, that's what Alcibiades meant about goodness. Now, to Plato's way of thinking and to philosophy in the West generally, knowledge, truth, and goodness, and beauty are all linked together. Uh, but at this point, we don't, we don't yet have Plato's conception, and we can think of Socrates as simply someone who's thinking of it as a personal quest. Um, here one might think of someone like Don Quixote, who, is, who may just be chasing uh, windmills, that is, he might be doing something that's simply ridiculous, but in his own mind, he's out to figure out what's most meaningful to him. In the history of the West, that is, Western philosophy, that's simply called subjectivity or relativism, depending on whether it's an individual or a group. So, in one sense, it really doesn't have any sort of uh, viability outside the person's head, but what Socrates seems to be implying, and it's going to be true of the later existentialists, is that that's what really matters. What goes on inside one's head is all one knows, and so what one is necessarily most concerned with. Uh, that other people believe something is fine for those other people, but I'm concerned about what I believe. And so the very thing that Western philosophy applauds about Socrates, that he would have that kind of integrity, is also the kind of thing that they would deplore when it comes to someone who would uh, sort of abandon um, the sort of the, the common wisdom of his or her time in favor of what they personally thought, that they would sort of gone, have gone overboard in thinking uh, that their opinion matters uh, more than the consensus of the group. And so uh, what Socrates is saying here is that uh, it's something more like uh, moral encouragement. Um, what we're when we're looking for the truth, we're not looking for um, um, a key that'll that'll unlock the the secrets of the universe. We're looking for um, something that's going to help us figure out more about ourselves. Now, in order to understand Socrates' point. Um, we can look at another passage from Plato's Gorgias. Uh, Plato takes it in a different direction than Socrates did, but it's still instructive to us. Um, in that dialogue, one passage goes like this. Uh, Socrates asks, Now, isn't a person who comes to understand building a builder? And the answer is yes. Uh, that is, you're not considered a builder. Uh, we might today say a carpenter, electrician, that kind of thing, unless you understand what's involved in that field. While a person who comes to understand music is a musician. 
Um, if ever in doubt, hand a violin to a beginner and you'll see the difference, right? They need to know how to make that instrument make music. They need to understand what it takes to cause that. And a person who comes to understand medicine, a doctor, yes, you and I would not go to just anyone and have them operate on us. So doesn't it follow that someone who has come to understand morality is moral? And the point here is, don't you have to know before you can do? Don't you have to understand whatever that discipline is, whatever that undertaking is, that craft, before you can be one of those, a craftsman, uh, and all the examples listed here, etc. So if I want to do what's right, as Socrates does, and be what's here being called moral, don't I have to understand what that means first before I can do it? It's why, for example, we wouldn't call other species moral or immoral, ethical or unethical. We'd simply say they just behave that way. That's what those critters do. Uh, Socrates seems to be wondering if maybe some types of behavior are right. <clears throat> Again, not in an epistemological sense, but best for the person involved. Plato will take it in the other direction, but Socrates is implying that he wants to know what's best for him. We might say by implication it would be best for anyone. Socrates at times might agree but his concern is really primarily with himself. Now this slide is meant to bring out that sense that Socrates has. Uh, at the top it says, knowing leads to doing. In other words, beliefs result in actions. So that if you think of certain thing, you'll do a certain thing. So it says, I have to know before I can do. Um, and the implication of that is that actions are different in kind than mere events. There were people around Socrates' time, uh, slightly before, who uh, suggested that uh, everything in the world is what you and I might call an event, and that would include people. Uh, those people that th think that way are usually called materialists. They think that everything in the physical world, the one and only world there is, happens according to physical law, and that our behavior is as subject to physical law as everything else in the world. Otherwise, the, the order of the world would be lost, so to speak. You'd have little bubbles where, <coughs> excuse me, there, that, that didn't function according to law, and somehow the, the universe would still be expected to keep its order, despite the fact that there were these little humans running around in whose heads there were non-events called beliefs or thoughts that didn't function like everything else. And of course, when you think of our perceiving things from our environment and then acting in response to them, the atomists, as they were called, people like Democritus and Leucippus, were saying the only way that that's possible is if you're being caused like everything that you are allegedly causing. So. Socrates is beginning to question that. His desire for an acquisition of what we would call knowledge is an attempt to suggest that there might be something called a self, or that one might be developed through the acquisition of what you and I would call knowledge. So I have down here the words, I am what I know. Unless I am a thoroughly physical process, a process that lasts 80 years, let's say, Socrates lasted just over 70. Uh, unless I'm simply a series of events or one big long event, then there is a thing called a self, and it's simply the acquisition of more knowledge. So as I said before, when Socrates acquires more knowledge, he's thinking of it as acquiring more self or more Socrates. <coughs> knowledge would be the stuff of which we're made. One way to illustrate this is to say, think of yourself as a baby. As a baby, you didn't have knowledge. You simply functioned as an organism. As you grew older, you learned more and more and could then act, could do things that were of your own doing. Take responsibility, blame, praise, etc. That's Socrates' point. What's being developed there is a self, the thing that you attach your name to or, or personal pronouns to. And so Socrates is saying, in effect, I think actions are implying. I think actions are distinct from events in that there's a doer involved, someone that actually uh, selects and chooses uh, what 
sort of actions to do, what to do and, and also what not to do. So from Socrates' point of view, knowing is always knowing oneself. We might say knowing about oneself, but since he's fusing the two, you can think of it as the same kind of thing. The process of knowing and knowing about oneself are the same. So an implication of this is that you can't know what's right and do what's wrong. You and I might say, I do it all the time. I knew what was right, but then I went and did the other thing. Uh, Socrates would say, in effect, you've shown that you didn't know it was right. It's not just what you say, but what you do, your behavior or your actions. Right? We just showed that, or Socrates is, is suggesting that if you know, that's going to lead to the action. So if you do something other than what you claim you know, then you don't know it. So I am what I know, slash say and do. Um, we think this as well whenever someone promises to do something and then does something else. We're judging them by what they actually do. They might um, tell us all kinds of things, but we're going to wait and see whether they really do it. Uh, also, another implication is that all wrongdoing is a sign of ignorance. Um, Socrates thinks if you really know, you will do what's right. So if you, as I said just a minute ago, if you don't do what's right, then you don't know what's right. And so you're ignorant of what's right. Um, an implication for Socrates is the most important thing is to care for that, for myself, for this knowing subject that I am, or at least appear to be. So that's why Socrates goes around trying to get all this information from everybody, because he wants to know what's what. He wants to be somebody, is really said, not in the sense of a, a big member of Athens, but he literally wants to be a subject and not be simply <clears throat> buffeted around by right, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. He wants to, he wants to really uh, to do, right, rather than simply be a, a series of events. So he thinks that it's better to suffer an injustice than commit one. And we'll see this when we get to the, uh, the ethics of the existentialists. Um, I might say I would much rather hurt someone else than have them hurt me in the same way. Uh, but Socrates is thinking something like the sticks and stones can break my bones, right? but only I can hurt myself because he's thinking of the self as so inextricably tied to knowledge or knowing that uh, other people might hurt me physically, but I'm the only one that can damage my character by doing the wrong thing. So for Socrates, knowledge is always oneself or knowledge, we would say, always about oneself. But he's really taking a, a completely different line and saying, no, the knowing is me. That's when, when, when we're talking about knowing, the doing of that is this thing that I call myself. And it's for that reason that Socrates' motto, so to speak, was know thyself. It's not original with him. Uh, it was taken from the oracle at Delphi. It was... So, uh, claimed to have been written on the inside of the uh, little shrine there. Um, at the city of Delphi in Greece, there's a spot where an oracle set and basically um, told the future, so to speak, in a way that a tarot card reader might or anyone who was a fortune teller. Uh, but they weren't literally saying this is what will happen. They were um, saying things and, and it was up to the person, almost like tea leaves or a fortune cookie, to discern what was actually meant. And um, we know that now that the, the spot where the, the oracle set was on a, a fissure in the side of a mountain and the gas was escaping up through uh, the crack in the, uh, in the rocks and making this uh, person a little bit loopy. If they sat there for a long time, very loopy. And so they weren't quite right in the head, but that was seen as uh, a way of sort of getting at uh, uh, a special understanding of things. And so one of the stories they uh, allegedly uh, told was that there was no one, uh, not Socrates was told this, but uh, someone that Socrates had known and Socrates later recounts this, that that person went to the oracle and the oracle said that there's no one wiser than Socrates. And 
Socrates couldn't understand what the oracle might have meant because the one thing Socrates was sure of was that he didn't have any knowledge, which is why he wasn't a teacher and all that. So uh, this sort of starts his project of going around talking to people, trying to see, well, wait a minute, this can't be right. Where are the people that do know stuff? And of course, you're going to go through all the sophists, the people who really know what's what. You're also going to talk to the alleged experts, the people who are, you know, ministers of one thing or another. If you want to know what justice is, you talk to the minister of justice and so on. However, unlike the sophists, if you make people in authority look bad, you're going to create enemies. And that was one of the problems that led to Socrates' undoing. He was too focused on this personal project to know how to save his own skin. Right? He was... <laughs> he, he was too smart for his own good, you might say. He was he was so concerned to do the right thing that it ended up ended up being his undoing. Now we we um, uh, sort of uh, think of Socrates as a great figure for that reason, but of course at the time when someone's suggesting that they might uh, put you to death for uh, things that you think ev not only you yourself must do, but you think everyone ought to do, then it becomes a little bit. Um, ridiculous, but Socrates is thinking the project is always knowing thyself, right? no matter who one is. A good way to see this is in Plato's dialogue Euthyphro, where Socrates is talking to uh, a man named Euthyphro who is persecuting his father for what Euthyphro uh, thinks is the impious act of murder. So when Socrates encounters him, he thinks, well, here's a guy who must know what piety is because He's doing something that could result in his own father's uh, execution. So, um, for our purposes, since what we're concerned about is something like the roots of existentialism, he asks Euthyphro, what is piety? And Euthyphro says that the pious is what is loved by the gods. Uh, in other words, um, I can tell whether something is pious or impious by whether or not the gods like it. And so Socrates asks him, uh, how does he know uh, what the gods love when, uh, in a polytheistic society as they are then, uh, the gods quarrel among themselves, and one might say yea to the same thing that another said nay to. And even if that weren't the case, how, quite literally, how does Euthyphro know? And that would be true today if someone uh, told me that they were doing what God wanted. I would want to know how. Uh, Socrates isn't asking, asking this facetiously. Um, if somebody can get aligned to the gods, then the gaining of knowledge would go much, much faster. So um, if Euthyphro knows that, Socrates is curious to find out. Um, so he then suggests to Euthyphro, is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious, or is it pious because it's loved by the gods? In other words, is it getting its characteristic of piety because of the gods' love, or do the gods look at it and say, yep, that's a terrific thing or a terrible thing based on its own attributes? So would they look at a, the act of murder just as we do and say, no, no, that's terrible. Don't do that. Uh, and so what he's um, suggesting, or at least implying, is that one might be able to figure out what's right and wrong the same way uh, that is with respect to action, the same way one figures out what things are or how things are in the world, that is, objects, so uh, or, or events. We might say we can tell the characteristics of a murder so that we know that if something happens, it will qualify as that kind of thing. And so that would give us the possibility, at least, of what we now call secular ethics, that is, an ethics that's not tied to claims about the gods. Um, one good thing about this is that it's universally applicable. If I commit murder... I'm subject to the same punishment as you are, uh, regardless of whether I say that the gods told me to do it and you say you just hated the person. Um, so uh, in one sense, even if I were a religious person, I would want there to be this secular ethics because it would mean that the same laws would apply to those people who are not religious. They couldn't kill me any more than I could kill them. That is, and get away with it. But what's involved here for Socrates at least, is not ethics in the sense that we understand it, 
uh, of like a code of universal, universally correct behavior. <coughs> Excuse me, but figuring out what he himself ought to do. And this is a point that we'll come back to many times, uh, but if you think of ethics, uh, which begin with Socrates, it's one of the reasons why he's such a huge figure in the history of Western thought. You think of ethics as uh, the same kind of thing as existentialism. Uh, it'll go a long way toward helping us understand later figures. Um, why should I do this rather than that? Um, for what reasons am I doing what someone might call the right thing? Am I doing it because I want the approval of those around me? Or am I doing it because God told me to do it? Or am I doing it because I simply think it's the right thing to do? And so those types of questions arise with Socrates, and they are the very same things that the existentialists will be worried about a couple of millennia later. Now, having angered many of his fellow Athenians, especially the ones who are in positions of power, um, the uh, nobles, let's say, the arist aristocracy of Athens wanted to get rid of Socrates. And so um, they trumped up the charges of corrupting the youth and not believing in the city's gods or inventing new ones. Um, while we have no reason to think that Socrates corrupted the youth as much as the sophists did, uh, we can think that uh, he really did cause them to question authority in a way that no one had before. And so the um, those in power in Athens realized that that was extremely dangerous and that we couldn't have people going around really trying to figure out uh, what you'd have to know in order to uh, uh, serve as a, a figure of some some note in some position of power. So uh, they accused him of these things, and in a quite long dialogue of Plato's, Socrates tried to defend, tries to defend himself, and that's really what apology means here. He's not saying he's sorry. He's saying, um, that this is my justification or apologia for uh, what I've done. Um, he mentions several times the word the God, or the words the God, um, in the dialogue, which would be foolish if he's trying to convince people that he believes in the city's gods. But what he seems to mean is something like truth in the sense of sincerity or honesty, and uh, always talks about uh, his divine sign, uh, meaning something like his conscience. He was always listening to his this inner voice, what would... Uh, what he really feels he ought or ought not do. And he thinks that that helps him to be what he calls a gadfly to the state. That is, to, to provide the kind of social criticism that we saw earlier in his dialectical method he would do to individuals. Um, and he thought it was a, a, a useful service. Um, he was definitely trying, he was concerned with himself, but he thought that this brought a certain integrity to Athens and kept them from resting on their laurels. At the end of the dialogue, he... Um, uh, he, he knows he's going to be put to death and requests that the state treat his sons the way uh, uh, he's treated them. They allegedly feel that what he's doing is wrong, and he says, if you want revenge, you should do to my sons what I'm doing to you. And it's his way of um, basically saying, look, I won't be there to raise my boys, and what I'm concerned most about is their character or their soul, their psyche. And so someone's got to be there to sort of make sure they do the right thing. Uh, he doesn't ask for material comforts. He's concerned that they uh, grow up to be good people. And as an illustration of his conviction, Plato's uh, dialogue Credo, in which a friend of Socrates has come to try to convince him to leave the holding cell, which he could leave because uh, Athens doesn't want to create a martyr of Socrates. Um, he chose uh, death over exile when given the choice at his trial and um, when Credo tries to convince him, uh, he basically says, sit down and let's talk it over, because as I've said, if the argument's more convincing, I have to go along with it. Um, but in this dialogue, um, what he tries to show, and this, is, this will come up for us later as well, is that even though Socrates has been wronged by Athens and falsely accused and sentenced, um, he feels that it's his obligation to obey the law uh, because he feels that the laws are a product of uh, an agreement among the citizens, let's say. And um, it's, it's his way of saying what mom did when she says uh, two wrongs don't make a right. 
Uh, but from a personal point of view, Socrates is saying, as I mentioned before, they can do things like hurt me or even kill me, but my character is up to me. So uh, we've seen later examples of this in people like uh, Thoreau and Gandhi and Martin Luther King, where uh, the content of one's, char one's character is the main concern. And so in this dialogue, Socrates is sh telling his friend why it matters that he do the right thing and that death is is not something t that should make one change one's mind. Uh, death is always um, out there. We'll see this with the existentialists. It's always looming over us. And then rather than using it as a an excuse to do the wrong thing, it should encourage us to to work within the confines of our birth and our death and say, what is the best thing I can do during that time? How can I make the most of myself? And the answer, Socrates is alleging, and the, and the existentialist will make explicit, is that my, that answer must come from myself. It can't ultimately come from anyone else. So um, here, he eventually ends up uh, convincing Credo that for these reasons, which Credo doesn't, still doesn't entirely understand, Socrates is going to have to stay and face the music. Then in the final scene, the Phaedo, uh, Socrates is about to drink hemlock and has friends around him who've come to visit, say goodbye, that kind of thing. And um, he begins to talk, and, and this is um, where the difference with Plato comes up a great deal. He ventures the uh, uh, belief that his soul is immortal, that it's separable from the body and uh, but he doesn't know whether that's the case or not. In his uh, apology, there's dis discussion about the nature of death, whether it is a sleep or a travel to some other world. And um, since he doesn't know, he actually uh, tells his friends around him that he sent the women away because he didn't want people crying. A very odd thing for someone to do when people have come to say goodbye to them. He actually wants, as he puts it, to die in good omen silence. Uh, in other words, shut up so I can concentrate here. Part of Plato's suggestion is that he's going to concentrate his soul for the separation from um, of the body from the soul. But for us, we can think of Socrates as simply saying, look, I don't know the answer to the question, what is death? And so this is my one and only opportunity to find out. Anyone who said that they know is lying because they haven't died yet. I'm about to... Uh, do that very thing, so be quiet. And so, in one sense, it's an illustration of what I was calling the selfishness of Socrates earlier, because he's so focused on himself, on on just what a self is, that he seems less than sensitive to his friends and family. And so, um, in this last scene, he's uh, wagering, as we'll see later, that uh, there is something to him besides uh, atoms moving around in the void. Uh, in other words, that he's something more than just the material conditions uh, that have caused the, the organism that was referred to by that name. Now, while there are lots of other dialogues that we could look at uh, where Socrates says one thing or another and makes a point about this or that, since our concern is with uh, existentialism and uh, the contention here that Socrates is the first of the existentialists, uh, it's, the, the, it's worth thinking about the relationship between ethics uh, and both traditional philosophy and what will eventually be spelled out as existentialism. Um, as we understand ethics now, uh, they are normative systems that sort of developed since the time of Plato for how people in general, how anyone ought to act, uh, with justifications as to why and why not, etc. But that's not quite the same thing as developing what the Greeks called an ethos. It's um, here you could think of it as a way of um, uh, being in the world, um, a character, something much more personal than uh, a system of ethics that would apply to everyone. Uh, you could think of it as a way of conducting yourself, um, what matters to you, and so to speak, a philosophy in the lower P sense, where it's a it's your general outlook on life. 
so that it's not expected to be the same as mine or that of someone else. Um, it's determining what one ought and ought not do, but specifically what you ought and ought not do. There may be things that are not right for me, but that may be right for you. And so while we may make big systems that say, here are the do's and don'ts, one thing that such a system denies us is our individuality. There may be things that you disagree with about that system or things that you want to do regardless of whether they're deemed correct or incorrect by the rest of society. So it's a matter, at least for Socrates, of figuring out what kind of person he ought to be and for you what kind of person you ought to be. And rather, really more than what kind, it's, it's figuring out exactly who you and you alone will be. And that's the project that Socrates was engaged, uh, in, uh, involved in, uh, of building his character, of deciding for himself rather than having his beliefs or thoughts imposed upon him, either by a particular someone or by Athens generally. So if you think to yourself, how can I tell whether I believe what I believe because I genuinely uh, think that something is or ought to be the case, or am I just doing it because everyone around me does it, or I've been told that it's right or wrong. So here we can think of ethics as the roots, or the root, depending on how you think of ethics, of existentialism, because it's a choice about how to live this one life here now. Um, in the mouths of Western philosophers, it's about how anyone ought to behave. But no one, this is one of the main points, is ever anyone or is ever everyone. Every person is always just that particular individual. And so, as Socrates was suggesting, the project is to know thyself and to exhibit that knowledge through your behavior. Not one's behavior, but through what you, between the time of your birth and the time of your death, think you ought to do. And so, it puts an enormous responsibility upon us as individuals because, in effect, no one else can do that for us. No one else can live our lives, and no one else can choose exactly what we ought to do between the moment of our birth and the moment of our death, except ourselves. <clears throat> and so for, for Socrates, despite Plato's uh, mis or different shape uh, characterization that he's given it over time, the project that Socrates started was how to know what it's right for him to do. And so that's not even the project for you, because you're not going to be Socrates any 